for nothing. He went through Calvary because he saw the travail of his soul. He saw the end result, and the scripture says he was satisfied. It brought him great pleasure. Now, the wonderful thing is that God's family is growing in this world at an exciting speed. As faithful members of the family share the truths of the Bible with their communities, did you realize that the spread of the gospel to all the world is one of the significant signs Jesus gave that would help us to know when his coming is near? You know, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached where? In all the world, for a witness unto all nations, and then what? Then shall the end come. So when you see the gospel of Jesus Christ being preached to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, being preached in all the world, you will know that the coming of Jesus is very, very near. We often talk of the wars and, and famines and pestilences and natural disasters, and all that is true. But Scripture highlights the spread of the gospel uh, to all the world as a, a significant sign. And I want to tell you, friends, that if that was the only sign that Jesus gave that would help us to know when his coming is near, I would have to say that the coming of Jesus, on the basis of what I have seen and observed myself, the coming of Jesus is very, very near. This gospel of the kingdom in all the world. You see, this church has taken the gospel commission seriously. And under the power of the Holy Spirit is reaching out with remarkable success in taking the gospel to different parts of the world. It's got to be the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, I believe, as I observe what is taking place. Now, I have here in my hands a copy of the Australasian record. You know, that was what it used to be called. They just call it today the record, don't they? It was the Australasian record. This one, this particular copy, was printed in the year that I was born. And at the top it calls it the Jubilee, the Golden Jubilee number. Because it was 50 years, celebrating 50 years of the Seventh day Adventist Church presence in this division. And, uh, and I was interested, of course, to, to have a look at this. The lead article in this uh, particular issue of the record was written by W.G. Turner, one of the uh, leaders, the early leaders of our church in this division, a division president one stage, and um, I want to just note with you that after uh, introducing uh, what he had to say in the early uh, paragraphs of, of his article, he then says this in, in just three lines, today as we look back and then view what God is doing in this particular field, we say with earnestness and humility, what hath God wrought? Now after 50 years, you see, he says, what hath God wrought? I have to tell you that, uh, that after another almost 70 years, that exclamation has particular significance. What hath God wrought? It's amazing what God has wrought in, in the work of his church. I was in, a, in a New York uh, one time a few years back, and I went into the American Bible Society uh, building, and there in the foyer, the entrance to the American Bible Society, there is a large illuminated display. I'm not sure if it's still there, but it was when I was there. This large illuminated display, bigger than a, a normal blackboard, and it, uh, it was divided up like a, a graph uh, page would be, with lines running uh, you know, vertically and lines running horizontally right across, so that the whole display was divided into little squares, and... Uh, at the top, right along the top, it had the names of the major churches. There were many of them. There may be about 50 different churches listed along the top, each church name corresponding with one of the columns that ran vertically, you see. And then down the side, on the left-hand side of, of it, this is your left, isn't it, over here, down the left-hand side of the, of the, the uh, display, um, corresponding with the horizontal lines, were the countries of the world. And, and they had them all listed there, see one after the other. So you'd, you'd see, uh, you know, Africa, and you'd look right across Africa. Well, not only Africa, of course, you, you have uh, Zimbabwe, see. You'd look right across the line that corresponded with Zimbabwe. And wherever you came to a dot, you would look up and you would see the name of the church. That dot indicates that that particular church has church work in that country, you see. 
Then if you went along further along the horizontal line, you'd see another dot and look up and see another, a different denomination now has work in that country. And so they had dots in the little squares that corresponded with the vertical and the horizontals. And this way you could, you could look at any one of the churches you wanted to and you could find out what countries they had church work in. And do you know there was one church listed on that display that had dots in practically every square it was the only church that had dots all the way down. It was almost a continuous line of dots down through that display, indicating that that church had work in practically all of those countries that were listed there. There was no other church that came anywhere near it. And do you know what church that was that had these continuous lines? Yes, the Seventh-day Advent. Your church, my church. I stood there, my chest swelled out, you know, I felt like a gorilla. <laughs> yeah, my church. Hey. That's how I felt about it. And that display was not prepared by the Seventh-day Adventists. It was pre prepared by the American Bible Society. But it illustrated the wonderful blessing of God. You know, it's a remarkable achievement, really, given the, humbi the, the humble beginnings of our church. It was only 144 years ago that the Seventh-day Adventist church was organized in 1860. And they voted at what they called a general conference meeting they voted to adopt the name Seventh-day Adventist. We had 125 churches then in all the world and 3,500 members. Uh, today, the membership of this church has uh, approached pretty, pretty, I'm talking about baptized membership now, has approached pretty well 13 and a half million members around the world. And it's growing at a tremendous rate. Approximately one million people joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the last 12 months. Every 12 months, another million. And, and of course, it's, it's not an arithmetic progression, it's a geometric progression. You know, an arithmetic progression is one that goes up on an on a, a, a even scale. A geometric one is one that curves steeper and steeper the further it goes. And that's the, the way the church is growing at a tremendous rate in the world today. I, uh, I want to tell you, friends, that uh, you know, there's one, one person baptized joins the church approximately every 30 seconds. In some lands, the growth is greater than others. I think of the Southern Asia Division. That's the one in which India is the major portion. Do you know that's, a, that's the fastest growing d division in the world? Their growth rate last year was 35% increase on the membership they had the year before. Uh, the, the next to that was a, a division that had a 17% growth, <laughs> you see. So India, a country of Hindus and, and other, you know, different persuasions, uh, for so many years a difficult place to make much progress, has just exploded with the, the Adventist message today, and I'll tell you more about that in a little while. Uh, do you know that every day, every day, there are given and contributed to this church in offerings and tithes by the members. I'm saying on the average of every day, the equivalent of seven and a quarter million New Zealand dollars contributed every day for the work of the church. And that's encouraging, isn't it? Do you know in 1940, there was one Seventh-day Adventist, baptized Seventh-day Adventist, for every 4,500 people in the world. That's in 1940. In 1960, there was one baptized Adventist for every 2,500 members. You see? So the ratio is improving, isn't it? In 1980, there was one baptized Adventist for every 1,500 members. In round figures. Wonderful improvement. In the year 2000, we're going in 20-year steps, you see? In the year 2000... There was one baptized Seventh-day Adventist in the world for every 527 people in the world. Hey, this is, this is real progress, isn't it? And do you know that today, in the year 2004, there is one baptized Seventh-day Adventist in the world for every 466 people? And I talked to the statistician at the General Conference about the uh, growth of the church and the, the uh, percentage of growth and all that kind of thing, and I asked him for some facts and figures. And uh, he told me that if we continue to grow at the rate at which the church is growing today, by the year 2134, if time should last that long, 
half of the world's population will be baptized Seventh-day Adventists and the rest of the world's population will be children in Adventist homes who are too young to baptize yet. We will have taken it all. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Wonderful. You know, and when Jesus says, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, then shall the end come. No wonder I say, that's the only sign we need to convince us that the coming of Jesus is very, very near because the gospel is going at a tremendous rate today into the world. I'm going to take most of the rest of the time telling you some of the stories that have brought encouragement to me because when I was at the general conference, it's like being at the center of the wheel. And all the spokes, you know, radiate out from the wheel and the stories come down those spokes to the center. And we get the stories from many places. Uh, 1957 was a very significant year. I'm going to tell you why it was. That was the year in which the first Sputnik was launched into space. How many of you went out that night and looked up in the sky and saw it? <laughs> yeah, some of you looked up and didn't see it. Eh? <laughs> and, and you looked up and saw it. I did too. I was in South Australia at the time. And it was my, uh, I, the, the other reason why 1957 was the most significant year is because that's the year that I was launched into my ministry. <laughs> it was the year of the launch of the Sputnik and the launch, of my launch into ministry. And I went in South Australia, my first appointment out of college, a little place called Peterborough, way up in the sticks. And I went out that night and I looked up in the sky, scanning the stars to see if I could see one that was moving. And sure enough, when at the right time, I saw this, this little spark of light moving right across the sky the first Sputnik into space you know friends I never dreamt as I looked at that that one day the, uh, the human uh, skills and the technological advances that made it possible to launch that Sputnik into space would be used to spread the gospel around the world but it has been I mean how many of you remember net 96 of course you do and net 98 uh, how that uh, this church is now using satellite uh, means the, the uh, availability of, of satellite technology to send this gospel message up to the satellite around the world to another satellite down to receiving stations all over the world. Tremendous advancement of the gospel. No wonder the spread of the gospel is re uh, represented in scripture as three angels flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel. And uh, you know that under Net 96, some 17,500 people were baptized as a, a result of Mark Finley's uh, Net 96 program. Do you know that in South America today, we have the church owns 30 radio stations and three television stations, and that uh, they rented for one whole year a space satellite 24 hours a day, for 365 days so that all the time, every moment of every day for that year, the message was being beamed to that satellite, was being used to beam down to all of South America the wonderful message of truth that uh, we have been commissioned to share. Wonderful, isn't it? Adventist World Radio is using 30 transmitters and 120 antenna in Russia transmitters that were set up to spread the communist uh, dogma and they're using these today to spread the gospel that uh, and and th those uh, transmitters reach into 90 percent of the homes in russia today if the people choose to turn the, their radios on and during the uh, net 98 program I, I was greatly impressed by the, the the way in which people in different parts of the world tried to participate in in that wonderful outreach and I think of Namibia. See, when I was at the General Conference, South Africa was one of the areas that was under my special attention. And I used to travel there. And Namibia is part of the, the Southern Africa Union. Namibia is up on the west side, and it's mostly desert areas. There are some near the coast that's not quite so desert-like. But that's where the Kalahari Bushmen live. Now, some of you will remember a, a film that came out some years ago in which um, a Kalahari Bushman featured. Do you remember the name of that film? The Gods Must Be... Crazy. <laughs> it was a funny film, wasn't it? Uh, we saw that uh, on television one time where the, there's an aeroplane flies over and the fellow throws a soft drink bottle out and it lands at the feet of, of one of these Kalahari Bushmen. He'd never seen a soft drink bottle in his life and he thought the gods were sending things down to him. It, it's an interesting story, isn't it? But that's where these people live, the Kalahari Bushmen. And we have some Adventists among these people. Many of them are little pygmies, short people. 
And uh, uh, when, when the Net 98 was being offered to the world and uh, uh, different parts of the world are being encouraged to, to get these dishes, you know, these satellite dishes that would receive the, the, uh, the footprint from, from the satellite, um, Kalahari Bushmen couldn't afford uh, to buy one of these because they're virtually a cashless society. You know, they're subsistence farmers, if you like. They're not really farmers. They just wander around in the bush and they kill animals and eat them and they get bugs out of the, you know, like the hoo-hoo bugs and you know, so forth. And, and, um, and so and what were they going to do to get this message? One day the people who served in the little mission office in the nearby town saw dust blowing down the street and the dust was increasing. They thought, what's causing all this dust? And they went out to have a look and here they saw all the cattle being driven down the street. The Kalahari Bushmen, Adventist Bushmen, were driving their cattle down the street to the mission station and they said, we want you to take and, and sell our cattle and use the money to buy the equipment we need so we can have Net 98. We want a dish, we want the projection equipment, we won't be able to share the message with the rest of the tribes people out in the deserts. And so the, uh, the mission people sold their cattle and with that they bought a dish and they bought a little generator and a, a projector that would, that would take the, uh, receive the message and, and project it onto a screen. And when the right time came, they set up a screen out there in the deserts where the Kalahari tribes congregate. And they set up the equipment and they pulled the, 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 the rope on the generator and got the little motor going and it, the, the projector came into life and there it threw uh, Dwight Nelson onto the screen speaking to them in the Kalahari language. You see, that program was being translated by 40 different translators at the uh, Andrews University Church and the different languages were going up to satellites and going around the world and coming down in the languages of the people where they were. Isn't that wonderful? And as a result of that, the sacrifice of these Kalahari Bushmen, many, many people were baptized amongst the, the Bushmen in the country of Namibia. Wonderful sacrifice. Now, the devil gets in the way sometimes and tries to stop the work. And I, I remember hearing the story of how that in one of the, our churches in Germany, they, they bought a dish for the, the uh, satellite reception and, and they set the dish up, but then they found it didn't receive well. And the problem they found, discovered was, was a large tree on their property that was interfering with the reception somehow. And so they went to the council and sought permission to cut this tree down and the council refused them permission. And the members had nowhere else they could put the dish and so they were really concerned about this and they, they went into a prayer season and prayed that God would somehow solve the problem for them. And do you know that night there came a fearful uh, thunderstorm and a, a, a stroke of lightning hit that tree and demolished it. That's right. It did. I think God has a sense of humor sometimes, don't you? <laughs> uh, wonderful story. And they were able to receive the message and to share it with their neighbors who came in to listen to the, the broadcast. Do you know Adventist World Radio is a wonderful means of spreading the message. And uh, the, the plan of Adventist World Radio was to establish a large transmitter station, a radio station with a huge, um, what do you call these things, these uh, antenna, uh, at a place in Italy, a place called Argenta. And so after investigating the matter, uh, our church put up the money, I think they paid over a million dollars for the property, a large piece of land where they were going to set up their building and and their, their antenna, huge, you know, big things like uh, with wires stretched on them and so forth for transmitting. And the plan was that they would transmit from this radio station to all of the Middle East, or particularly the, the Muslim countries, the Islam countries, uh, and they would transmit in the, the, uh, the languages that would be understood by these people. Um, we went several years working on that, trying to get the final permission to start building and uh, early works were done, a lot of money was spent, but we never built at Argenta. And the reason we did not build was because uh, certain uh, environmentalists approached the uh, councils that were concerned with, uh, with the permission that we would, were seeking and pointed out that the antenna would be right in the path of migrating birds. 
and that it would be a, a hazard to these birds and therefore we should not, not be allowed to, to, to uh, erect the antenote. So permission was finally denied. Uh, the church having received initial permission before the money the, that had been spent was spent uh, were able to uh, negotiate, I, I think it fell short of suing, but they were able to negotiate with the, the council for uh, compensation for the money that had already been spent. But what were we going to do? I mean, we wanted to, to share the message through radio broadcasts with, with all that portion of the 1040 window, and uh, the devil had seemed to get in the way, if, if, if you could think of the birds as the devil at that point. <laughs> um, now, it was right at that time that the British Board Broadcasting Corporation made an approach to Adventist World Radio. And they said, we have just taken up broadcasting rights to a huge radio station in, in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. We have use of that radio station 24 hours a day, and we would like to offer to Adventist World Radio 20 hours a day continuous broadcasting from this huge radio broadcasting station in Abu Dhabi. You couldn't have, uh, have uh, dreamed up anything better than that. Not as good as. It seemed the Lord had plans in mind for us, and so we, we took up uh, the option that was given to us by the British Broadcasting Corporation. This radio station covers all of the Middle East, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Iran, Iraq, Somalia, Yemen, Oman. All of those countries are covered by this radio pre uh, uh, station, and we can do it at a fraction of the cost it would have been using a radio station in Italy. A fraction of the cost. We don't have the outlay in the first place, nor the maintenance of the station. Just the opportunity to use it 20 hours a day. Isn't that wonderful? God is richly blessed. And so the message is going out. Now, speaking of uh, Islam and uh, the Islam uh, countries, the Muslim people, you know, it's been a very difficult work, and I've had lots of people ask me, how is our work progressing amongst the, the Muslims? I have to tell you it's going very well. Um, there are some stories we cannot tell because, you know, you, you, it's very, uh, very uh, sensitive, the, the way the work is being done in some countries, and we have to be very careful about that. You know, in Bangladesh, which is up there, you know, you look at India, and it's on the right-hand side of India, right up there in the, in the curve of the, of the land, uh, it's a low-lying country where uh, floods devastate that country from time to time and you, it's nothing to hear of a million people displaced because their homes have been flooded out. Um, in the Bangladesh is a country that is 90% Muslim. And do you know that for the first 80 years of our work in Bangladesh, we baptized only 20 people in 80 years. How could we possibly break through? There's a new initiative in Bangladesh today where the church has entered into this, this new approach um, using the Koran because the Koran runs parallel with the Bible in many, many things. You can teach most Adventist doctrines from the Koran. And the Koran mentions Jesus Christ. It doesn't recognize him as the Son of God, but it does recognize him as a prophet. And so using the Koran mostly and talking to these people, our workers in Bangladesh are today baptizing approximately 1,000 people every year. Compare that with 20 altogether in the first 80 years. The Lord has opened up ways, you see, by which we... I, I was um, impressed when Dr. Darnell, I think he's passed away since, but when Dr. Darnell uh, told his story of how he was conducting evangelistic meetings in Egypt on one occasion few years back now, um, he, uh, Egypt, of course, is largely Muslim, and he was summoned by the Grand Mufti to come and see him. Now, this man is the leader of the Muslims in all of Egypt. Now, I've been to the mosque where he, uh, where he uh, ministers, and uh, in fact, when there were four of us who traveled together around the world, and, and we went to that mosque, we had formed a quartet. It was Rex Moe, some of you know Rex Moe, and David Lawson, and uh, Bill Slight, whose son is the president in Christchurch now, the church there, and, and myself, four of us. We traveled around the world together 
uh, on one of these tours to visit Bible lands and to pick up things that would be useful in evangelism. And when we went into this mosque in Egypt, we lined up there. We said, this place has a ring to it. The acoustics are wonderful here. Let's sing. And we started singing songs uh, such as, Hold the fort, for I am coming. Jesus signals still. <laughs> Wave the answer back to heaven. You know, uh, And we sang. And it wasn't long before the Grand Mufti came out with some of his people. They, came, they heard the singing, you see? And they came up and the, out and they lined up as an audience in front of us. And when we finished, they said, Ah, oh, more. <laughs> Give us more. So we sang a number of gospel songs to these people in their mosque. Well, this man uh, had, had uh, summoned Dr. Darnell to come. And, and so when he went there, he went there with some trepidation because people had been known to disappear in, in, uh, in Muslim countries. And the man talked to him for some time. The first question he asked was, what do you think of uh, Muhammad? Well, you've got to be careful how you answer that. If you say anything that is uh, in a Muslim country that, that can be interpreted as a criticism or a slight against uh, Muhammad, your head could come off. So Dr. Daniel gave his answer, very carefully chosen answer. He said, I believe that man had a, an understanding of much of the truth of, of God's word. Um, and uh, apparently his answer was satisfied, the, uh, the leader of the Muslims in that country. And so after a little more discussion together, this man leaned over the desk toward Dr. Darnell and he said to him, you know, in the Islam faith, we have 73 divisions. It's something like the different denominations in Christianity. You have the Methodist, you have the Presbyterian, you have the Church of England, you have the Catholic, you have the Adventist. We have 73 divisions in the Islam faith. And he said, we believe that before the Messiah comes, for they're looking for the Messiah also, before the Messiah comes, God, Allah, Allah is going to raise up a great teacher. And that teacher is going to bring us all together in the unity of faith. So there will be no divisions but unity before Allah. And then he leaned over the desk to Dr. Daniel and he said, I want to know, are you that great teacher? Isn't that astonishing? Are you that great teacher? You know, we have a message for the, the Muslims too. And maybe God is going to use you or me, someone else within our family, to bring the 73 divisions of the, the Islam faith together before Allah. That's their name for God in preparation for the coming of Messiah. Wonderful, isn't it, when you think of these things? I, I was interested in a story that came out of Ethiopia just a few years ago now, but it, it's very interesting because when the royal family of Ethiopia was ousted uh, by the communist regime, uh, many of the, the royal family were, were put in jail. And they endured very poor conditions, shocking conditions in jail. And uh, the leader of our church uh, in that division at the time asked the authorities if the Seventh-day Adventist church could do something to help the royal family. Maybe we could bring some things in that would make their, their conditions a little more comfortable and a little more bearable in prison. And they were told that, it, it, while, that while we appreciate your thought, that could be misunderstood. It could make trouble if the royal family is being treated just by the Seventh-day Adventist. You could be seen to be in league with them and it could cause you trouble and it was suggested to our church that we prepare help for all the prisoners not just the royal family and that way we could help them out and you know what the church decided to do they decided then to ask the prisoners what they would like what can we do to help you what would you like us to bring for you and do you know that they had 15,000 prisoners ask for Bibles that's what they wanted more than anything else Bibles you know, when you hear and read, and read statements from Ellen White's writings where that she says there are, there are thousands of people out there who are looking longingly toward heaven for light and truth, it's just our responsibility to find them where they are, isn't it? And they're waiting. They're longing for an, the opportunity to, to uh, receive uh, the blessings of God. I think of the Maasai people in Africa. A Maasai boy was employed at Maxwell School. It's our boarding school in Kenya. 
and he spent uh, his first day's pay on drink and didn't return to work, so he was dismissed. Uh, he came back later and applied again, and he was hired as a security guard, and then things began to go missing, and they traced it back to him, and so he was dismissed again. He was very unhappy about this and decided to oppose and destroy the small church uh, group that had been established there, um, and so he began his, his opposition. It was very sharp opposition. One of the faculty members, uh, in the, the wisdom of, that God gave to him, I believe, went to this young man, the Maasai boy. You know, the Maasai are those people that stand out there minding their, their sheep and they stand on one leg with a big stick, you know, stand there all day on one leg and, and uh, minding their, their goats and their sheep. I've seen them out there in the country where there are lions all around, and they'll defend their lions with this long stick, stick they've got, defend their, their flocks against the lions. Well, the faculty member went to him, and he said to this boy, you know, you're not doing much good opposing the work of the church here. Why, if you don't like what we're doing here, why don't you go out and set up a church of your own? <laughs> that was a brilliant idea, wasn't it? You know, you go and, go and, and so he was given a picture roll, and he headed out without any training or basic knowledge, I, su I suppose you could say, of, of our truths. Uh, he went out. After some months, he sent word that he had a group ready for baptism. And when they went there, they found 11 people were ready and they baptized them. And they found that that group he had prepared were better prepared than many who were prepared by the ministers in Africa. <laughs> now, you tell me, what was the, the reason? I mean, how come that this young man who had very little understanding or preparation, that he was able to prepare people so wonderfully well. What do you think was at work here? The Holy Spirit, of course it was. The Holy Spirit was at work. In Tanzania, uh, a student from Andrews University, Henry Mahando, who, who uh, came from Tanzania, was at Andrews University, and during his vacations, he would go back to Tanzania, and he decided to run an evangelistic crusade in the city of Dar es Salaam, and so uh, he trained a large army of helpers, mostly lay people, and then he booked a large playing field, a field used by the Pope when he visited the country. Many of the members said, that's too big, you'll never fill the, this, you know, the people that will come to listen to you will be just a small group down here in the front, it'll look, it'll look silly. But he went ahead by faith. He said, you, you've got to have faith. Do you know when Henry Mahando started, the first night there were 1,000 people present. The second night there were th 5,000 people there. Then it grew to 10,000, and by the end of that week, Henry Mahando had 50,000 people attending his meetings each night. And I've got three photographs here showing part of the crowd. A huge crowd of people attending his meetings. God was using this man as he preached the message amongst his own people, and thousands were baptized as, as a result of, uh, of his evangelistic work there. I think of Rwanda, the country that was devastated by terrible uh, manslaughter. Uh, Elder Appenzeller, who was the General Conference Literature Evangelistic Leader, was there at one time, and he visited with the Literature Evangelists, and he went up to a little little man, and he said to him, how's the work going? And the, young man, the, the little man said, well, my work is going well. And so uh, the General Conference Publishing Director said to him, tell me, how well is your work going then? You say it's going well, how well? And so this little man pulled out of his, uh, his string bag here a roll of paper. Uh, it was a roll that was made up of separate little pieces of paper, all stuck together with a piece of sellotape or sticky tape, you know? Little bits of brown paper, little bits of white paper, little bits of note paper, all kinds of, of bits of paper, all stuck together. And he began to unroll it. And on every one of those little bits of paper was the name of somebody who had been baptized as a result of this literature evangelist's work, and every one of those pieces of paper had the pastor's signature on it, signifying that this is the pastor who baptized that person. Do you know how many pieces of paper there were? There were 969 pieces of paper, each with the name on it, that had been baptized in the last three years of that literature evangelist ministry. A humble little man, but he loved the Lord, and he went out and shared his faith. You know, it takes all kinds. He was, he was humble and probably quite poor. We have some very wealthy Adventists in America, and I think of Milton Afonso. Milton Afonso is probably the wealthiest Seventh-day Adventist in the world. 
This man gives three million American dollars to the church every month. His annual income is one hundred. No, no, I'm sorry. His annual income is two billion U.S. dollars every year. Now that's a lot of money, isn't it? I can't imagine it. In one two-year period, he gave a hundred million million U.S. dollars. He's the one who bought the thirty or twenty-three of the, of the thirty radio stations. He's the one who bought the three television stations. He's the one who paid for the whole year use of the satellite. And, and he's the one who maintains the medical and missionary launches on the River Amazon. I flew with him in a small float plane from the city of Manaus up the, the Amazon River one time, just the three of us, the pilot, Milton Afonso, and myself. And he talked the whole way excitedly how the Lord had opened opportunities for him to share his faith through the use of his money. He wasn't boasting. He was giving God all the glory. And he's such a humble little man, you'd never know that he had a lot of money. I think of others in America. I think of another man who had a great concrete mixing business, and he sold that business for 250 million American dollars, and he's given most of that money to the church in various ways. He's put thousands of roofs on churches in Africa and other places where they can build their, their walls out of mud bricks, but they can't afford the corrugated iron for roofs. He's put on thousands of roofs. He uh, sold a huge yacht that he owned in order that he might use the money from that to buy the printing presses for our publishing uh, house in Russia. And I could go on you know, all day talking about some of these things. Wonderful, the way the Lord touches the hearts of, of men and women, wealthy and poor, uh, humble and otherwise, to do his work. I think of the humble witness. In inter-American division, there was a little lady who was bedridden. She uh, couldn't get out of her bed. But she wanted to share her faith, and so she said to her husband, what can I do to share my faith? I, I want to be, be able to share my faith also. So what did they do? He went around the neighborhood and gathered up chairs until he had 40 chairs, which he brought into the house, and he put them all around her bed in the little bedroom, and then he put them in the passage, and he put them in the, the rooms around until there was no more room for any more chairs. Then he went out and invited all their neighbors and friends to come in. My wife is sick in bed, but she has something she has to tell you. You must come and hear what my wife has to tell you. Do you know, at the last count, that woman had prepared over 300 people for baptism. Lying in her sick bed, sharing her faith. I tell you, it makes me humble when I hear and see some of these things around the world. In the city of Manaus, which I mentioned a moment ago, in the river Amazon, it's at the confluence of the Negros and the Amazon rivers in North Brazil. There are 130 churches in that small city and 70 companies, 26 Adventist schools and 30,000 members. How do they have so many Adventists in this little city? I'll tell you just one story. It's very brief. There is one little 16-year-old girl who went out from door to door, knocking on the doors, sharing her faith. And in one 16-month period, she prepared 200 people for baptism. That's just one little 16-year-old in that church. All the members, the lay people, are out sharing their faith. They live for this reason. This, this, they're motivated to do this. Every spare moment they have, bringing men and women to a knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. You know, in, in the southern United States, there was a little lady, a black lady, who lived in a, a town all by herself. There are no other Adventists there, and she wanted to share her faith too. But she didn't know how. And one day she was looking through the newspaper and she, she noticed that there was an advertisement for a little stone church for sale. Some other denomination was selling their church. And so on impulse she went out and bought it. And then she prepared a, a, a sign, we call them a rude sign, you know, it means rough, a rough sign that she painted herself with Seventh-day Adventist church on it. Sabbath school, 9.30. Church service, 11 o'clock. And she put this up in front of the church. The next Sabbath, she went along to church. Sabbath school in church, and she was the only one there. Of course. She sat there and read her Bible and prayed and sang a hymn or two. And then the next Sabbath, she went along again. She got tired of worshipping on her own. So she got in touch with the conference president, and she said, Look, I'm wondering if you could help me. She said, I, I, I own a church here. We have a Seventh-day Adventist church I bought. And I'm the only one that worships in it. Can you help me? And he was so impressed, he sent an evangelist, and today there are 60 people worshipping in her church <laughs> because she had the initiative to go out and buy a church. I, I think of India, the 50 village program, the ASI layman. You know, ASI stands for uh, Association of Self-Supporting Industries in America. These are lay people who have businesses, and they're committed. When they join ASI, they're committed to use some of their profits 
in some cases, most of their profits, for the advancement of the work of the church. And they have a convention once every year, and uh, some from New Zealand have been to it. I invited them to come over, and they did. Uh, it's a wonderful occasion where you get to encouraged. And they organized a, a, an evangelistic crusade to India where they were going to have evangelists in 50 villages and then one final great uh, gathering call. As a result of that program, just a couple of years ago, they raised up 57 new companies and built 57 church buildings for them. <laughs> you know, the General Conference has this plan now that they're not going to support any evangelism from one country to another unless the team that goes has money to build a church for the, the company they raise up and to support a minister to stay there and foster them. And so that's what ASI did. And, and the, they baptized... As a result of that program, 15,018 souls. And then since then, another 5,000 have been baptized. And another 50 villages are crying out for the Adventists to come to them. All over India, the villages are crying for the Adventists. Please come, please come, please come. Uh, and we need to, to meet. In, uh, there's a, a Pastor Rao. In 1996, Pastor Rao baptized 463 people in a, a, a town called Babili. Then he left by a motorized van for another place. They were going to go to another place and start meetings, and the van broke down when they were partway there, and it refused to start. And so they went back again to, to the town where they had been, and uh, as he was explaining to the folk that he'd been staying with what needed to be done and that the van had broken down, there was a knock on the door. You know? And when they went to the door, there was a man there who said, I am from Orissa. That's 250 miles away. He said, I've come here looking for the evangelist who baptized all those people in Babili. And he said, well, yes, uh, the evangelist is here. The man of the house said, yeah, come in. So when he came in, the man from Orissa said, I've come all this way. I am in charge of 40 Baptist ministers in uh, Orissa. And I want you to come and conduct uh, a revival meetings for my ministers. And so Pastor Rao said, well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and if I come and conduct revival meetings, I'm going to teach the Seventh-day Adventist message. This man said, that's what we want. We want to hear what you have to say. And so Pastor Rao abandoned his plans to go to this other place where they had been headed. You see, the, the Holy Spirit prevents people going where they want to sometimes. Didn't that happen in New Testament times? Paul was wanting to go one place and the Holy Spirit took him over to another place where he got the call from Macedonia. And so this is what happened here. Pastor Rao went to Orissa and he conducted his meetings and all 40 Baptist ministers became Seventh-day Adventists and dedicated themselves to working to bring their congregations into the church as well. And more than 3,000 people were baptized as a result and the work is still going on in that area as a result of that wonderful, uh, that wonderful story. You know, children too. I, I don't know how many of you have heard children preachers, but I have. I went into the Inter-American Division and I heard children, a nine-year-old boy, I heard him get up on, on, the, on a platform where they put a little stand for him to stand up here. And he preached a powerful sermon. And some of these children, they haven't learned it para fashion. They can simply say to you, you give me a text in the scripture that you'd like me to preach on. So you choose any text you like and they'll get up and preach on it you see so they know what they're on about and the holy spirit uses them and they decided just a, a couple of years back that they would have a year of evangelism for the pathfinder clubs of the inter-american division that's the division between the united states and south america it includes the caribbean and some other countries there mexico costa rica puerto rico and so on so they they did they prepared, and do you know that that year, that was 1998, the Pathfinders conducted 21,156 evangelistic crusades. That's a lot of crusades. And as a result of the preaching of those children, 20, no, no, 56,986 people were baptized as a result of the preaching of the children. I have a letter here from Elder Maganda, the world youth director, in which he's given me those details. When I heard the story, I asked him if he'd write it out for me and give it to me, and he has. Wonderful, isn't it? Pathfinders. In Korea, we have the Samyuk University, 3,000 students at that university. 1,000 of them are not Adventists. 
they have a whole team of chaplains at that university, and every year they baptize 800 of the 1,000 non-Adventist students. It's one of their greatest outreaches in, in Korea. I think of Romania, the former communist country. General Chis was the commander of prisons in all of Romania, and he visited the General Conference office in Washington, he came as a, as a guest, and while he was there, he was given the book Desire of Ages. That man must have read all night because he came back the next day and he said, I want 100,000 copies of that book. I want to give one of those books to every government officer in Romania and to every prisoner in the prisons of Romania. He said, not only do I want 100,000 Desire of Ages, I want 100,000 Great Controversy. I want 100,000 Steps to Christ, 100,000 Ministry of Healing, and 100,000 Bible Readings. So here is this general, a general of the Romanian army, sharing our message with the whole country, with the, with the political leaders, the officers, and with the prisoners. I think of the Ukraine. These are countries that were under the communist rule a few years ago. Lonnie Meloshenko, our... Uh, a voice of prophecy speaker in the United States went into uh, Ukraine and he told me how that he met a pastor's wife there who for 35 years had spent 10 to 12 hours every day during the week sitting underneath a table cross-legged on the floor with blankets over the tables right down to the floor to make sure that she was she was kept uh, you know uh, uh, secret from anyone that might come in and, and she was sitting under this table by candlelight at an old typewriter typing out spiritual material for the pastors to use in their missionary work. She would have 12 sheets of rice paper with carbon sheets between as she typed out spiritual material. 35 years, 10 to 12 hours a day, cross-legged under the table. That was the commitment of those people. And Lonnie Manashenko told me, he said, I could not have been more honored if I had met the Apostle Paul. You know, she is one of God's family too. These people I'm telling you about are part of God's family, the family that he wants to gather home into the heaven. The prison ministries, I could talk for a long time about prison ministries. Do you know there's a man in, in California by the name of Terry Moreland? Terry Moreland built a prison in California. He's an Adventist, and in that country you can build prisons, privately owned, but do you contract with the government to look after the prisoners? And so he built this prison that would hold 250 inmates. And he decided that in that prison they would have special programs. He had dentists come in and fix the teeth because, um, you know, if your teeth are no good, it, it breaks down your self-image. Um, and so he had the, the teeth of the prisoners fixed up. He, uh, he did not have them in prison garb, but let them wear, you know, suitable clothes that they'd feel much better about it. They ran uh, five-day plans to stop smoking. They ran uh, cooking demonstrations, health programs. They brought in ministers who conducted Bible studies for those who were willing to attend. And do you know, at the end of the first five months of those 250 inmates, they baptized 197 of them. Isn't that amazing? Wonderful means of outreach. God is richly used. I, I haven't time to tell you about my visit to the prisons in the Philippines where there are 7,000 prisoners in the, um, in the maximum security. These are the worst. They're guarded night and day, uh, iron gates, armed guards, savage dogs, and all the rest. Do you know that 1,300 of those 7,000 are today baptized Seventh-day Adventists who've given their hearts to Christ since being incarcerated in the prisons? 254 of those Seventh-day Adventists are on death row awaiting execution. And it's all the work of one couple who have dedicated their lives. I preached in, we have three churches inside that prison, three Seventh-day Adventist church buildings inside the prison. And I preached in one of those, and uh, it, it was a thrilling experience. The treasurer, who has served 22 years of a 42-year sentence, sang the special song for my service, and he sang Amazing Grace. <laughs> I could hardly speak when I got up, I tell you. Uh, the uh, head elder is a man who killed 32 people, but he's forgiven by the grace of Jesus Christ. Now, the last story I want to tell is from Vietnam. And we, we're right out of time, as you can see. 
But I, I, I have to tell you that the story from Vietnam is a thrilling story. Pastor Isaiah Yong is a Vietnamese pastor who lives in California. And there are many Vietnamese in California. And so he is a pastor to those. And he had decided to broadcast. So he prepared broadcast and through a, a you know, narrow band radio, he has been broadcasting his messages to all over Los Angeles particularly. And the Adventist World Radio heard about his broadcasts and they said, hey, why don't you let us have your tapes of your sermons and we'll broadcast them from Guam, uh, 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 from the great transmitters we have there, and we'll beam it into Vietnam, because it's all in the Vietnamese language, you see. We'll beam it into Vietnam from Guam. And so that's what's been happening. And do you know that there has been a tremendous result? One pastor in Vietnam who was the head pastor of a, a denomination that had 70,000 members accepted this message as a result of these broadcasts. Uh, another 40 pastors of another denomination became Seventh-day Adventists. We sent 20 of them to our college in Thailand to do further training, and they've gone back to Vietnam now as ministers who work under that communist regime and are able to do their work uh, in much, much of it in secret. When it was planned to baptize these people, Pastor Zhong went to Vietnam, and he knew that the communists would be watching him and everything he did would, uh, would be re recorded and, when he wanted to train the people, he would hire a bus, and as they traveled, he would talk to them in the bus, or they'd take a ship out to sea, and they'd, they'd have their workshops out at sea where the communists couldn't see what was going on. But when it came to baptizing, that's a different matter. You can't baptize people in, in Vietnam. If, if you're caught doing it, uh, this man would have been either imprisoned or, or expelled from the country. So do you know what he did? He took the whole party down to the beach, and they went swimming. And as they swam in the surf, every now and again, one of these uh, p persons, candidates, would come swimming by, and as he swam by, he'd duck him. <laughs> and then as another came by, he'd duck him too later, and then they'd swim around in the surf for a while, and then another. He told me himself. He told me that this is what he did. And the Lord has richly blessed the work. Do you know that some people are predicting that in Vietnam, within 10 years, we'll have a 100... Uh, I'm sorry, we will have a million Seventh-day Adventists in Vietnam alone within 10 years. Praise the Lord for that. You see, what did Jesus say as he discussed these signs with his disciples and through their writings with us? He said, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is near, what is near? Second coming, even at the doors. What rejoicing there must be in the courts of heaven as they see the family of God being brought together one by one around the world. And, uh, and I want to tell you, friends, it has been a thrill to me. I, I've been to many of these countries, maybe a hundred countries during my stay at the General Conference and, uh, and other travels, and, and I've seen the work of, of the church in these many countries. You know, my eyes have seen and those not of another, <laughs> as Scripture says. I have seen it for myself. And I want to tell you that it is very, very thrilling. Soon the family will be complete and Jesus will come to gather us all home. I was in Dallas, Texas for the General Conference session in 1980. Some of you might have been there. If you were, you will remember that the meeting place was a huge single dome building, great big dome over the skies, and it seated about 12,000 people. And during the opening meeting, a special mention was made of the leaders of the church who had passed away during the last five-year period, and we were asked to observe a minute's silence in honor of those leaders, to meditate on their commitment and, and our response to the commission. And so we all stood, and there you could hear a pin drop. It was absolutely silent, 12,000 people not making a sound except breathing. And at the end of the minute's silence, a single trumpeter had made his way up into the superstructure, right up in the top of the dome somewhere, and he began to play on his trumpet with clear, unadulterated tones. The golden morning is fast approaching. Jesus soon will come. You know how the chorus goes? Oh, we see the gleams of the golden morning piercing through this night of gloom. Oh, we see the gleams of the golden morning that will burst the tomb. And as the final note echoed across the dome, back and forth across the dome, and then fell to silence, I felt like standing up and shouting hallelujah. I did, I tell you. 
I'm not that sort of person normally. I don't go around shouting hallelujahs very often. But I felt like it that day. You know, I, in my mind's eye, I stood at another place at another time and heard the clear trumpet call that will sound across the dome of heaven. <laughs> For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. You know, I want to read the, the last paragraph of W.G. Turner's record statement. He said, When the jubilee shall sound in the kingdom of God, may we who are to, today within the circle of his cause, together with many others yet to be gathered in, find our feet walking the streets of gold and our hearts rejoicing in the knowledge of a completed work. The family, home at last. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Our loving Father, we're so grateful that uh, you have given us a part in this work because it excites us, it thrills us as we share our faith with others and see men and women and children accepting Jesus as their Savior and the precious truths for these last days. And we are rejoiced to see that the message is going so fast and spreading out all over the world, soon to be finished. Gather us home, Lord, as sons and daughters of yours, the family of heaven. We ask in Jesus' name.